everyone, and welcome to Behind the Mic Radio. I am your host, uh, Dom Mack, and so very glad to be here with you on this Thursday evening. Welcome, everyone, and uh, I hope it's been a great day. It's Friday Eve. I mean, the weekend is here almost. One more day to the work week for many of you, and uh, I know that uh, it, it won't be long now. So we're on the home stretch, folks. Um, I want to welcome everyone in, and if you're a brand-new listener or program, welcome aboard. Uh, we're so glad to have you joining us tonight, and what a great night for you to tune in. Um, we are so excited about our guests this evening, and uh, it's not every day. Uh, you get a guest like this on our show, and so we're just so very honored and proud uh, to have her with us. And to give you a little background on her, um, our special guest starred as Erin on the award-winning television series, The Walton, one of my all-time favorite shows, I might add. And uh, she starred on the show for nine years, as well as in the made-for-TV reunion movies that followed. Most recently, she played Miss Will Hoy on The New Adventures of Old Christine and was a guest star on such hit series as Will and Grace and ER. She wrote and directed the award-winning film For the Love of May and continues to act on stage and screen. She was the founding director of Lupus LA and created InTheKnow.org to raise awareness about women's health issues and recognition of her activism. The American Heart Association honored her with the prestigious Les Petola de Accor Award. A sought-after speaker and workshop leader, she guides women and teens towards improving their body image through healthy lifestyle choices. She also teaches acting as a method of raising confidence and improving communication skills. We are so very proud and honored to welcome Mary McDonough. Hello. Hello. Wow, that was lovely. Thank you. You're so very welcome, and you deserve every word and, and, and then some. I mean, um, I just I just want to say a huge thank you for being with us tonight and, uh, and joining us on our program. Oh, you're oh, thank you for having me. You're very, very welcome. I'm glad to be here. Well, thank you. Um, I mean, you have done so much. I mean, from the Waltons to now, it's, it's all almost a matter of what have you not done to this point. You, you've really accomplished a lot. Kudos to that, you on that. But the, the one thing I want to start out with is I want to first congratulate you on the success of your book, Lessons from the Mountain, What I Learned from Aaron Walton. Thank you very, very much. It's been quite rewarding and, and uh it's been a, a wild ride, but it's been very uh, wonderful to have so many people enjoy the book and to read the stories about the show and write me about them and and about the issues that I talk about in the book. It's It's been very wonderful. People have been very lovely about it. Well, I think for a lot of people who have been longtime diehard Walton fans and continue to be, the book has been a great walk down memory lane, if you will, in one respect. And, uh, you know, but it also outlines so many of the lessons learned, as your title suggests, um, growing up on the television, you know, on television right before our eyes, um, being that you were 10 when you started. What would you say is the biggest lesson that you learned um, from all your years on the Walton? I think the biggest lesson I, I often talk about is is about being in appreciation and standing in gratitude. I think I look at the show and all of the lessons from the show, the the lessons on family, on community, on morals, on and uh, values, and all of those lessons are so great. But they've all brought me to a great uh, understanding about how how lucky I am and to really count my blessings and and be very grateful for all of the things that that I have learned from the show and in my life. Well, one of the things that that I think is just so incredible about the book is is how candid you are in the book about so many different aspects of your life and and what are some takeaways that you hope readers will get from the book? Well, I hope that people really love listening to the stories, you know, the wonderful memories and, and my my memories of each cast member and how special they are to me. But I also, um, on a personal note, I really hope that uh, men and women can learn something from the mistakes that I made in life, especially about body image and self-esteem and self-worth, and to realize that what, their, what our value is and 
and sort of a return to yourself. I think those are those are important themes for me in my life. And the reason I wrote the book is so no one would feel the way I did when I was growing up and and going through learning my tough lessons. <laughs> so yeah. I think that, you know, to have that takeaway and that and um and certainly, you know, I have had I hear from people that they do, so it is very rewarding. I'm sure, and, and you know, and, and this is the type of stuff that you, you know, you've been able to work through it, but you're on the other side of it now, and, and just, it stays with you the rest of your life, but to just look back and see, you know, where you were to where you are now, it's just amazing. What a journey, indeed. Um, fans, you know, came to know you and the cast of the Waltons pretty much for the first time through the series, and um, and how were you actually tapped for the role of Aaron? I'm sure a lot of people have always been curious about that. I was one of hundreds of of kids that were brought in because I had red hair. And we all auditioned for The Homecoming, which was the precursor to the series, the the Christmas special. So Mm -hmm. I was brought in only because I had red hair and freckles and they were looking for a red-headed family. And I, I got to audition, and they narrowed it down and narrowed it down and narrowed it down, and finally it came, you know, down to us, the last six kids, and we got brought in, and Richard Thomas was there, and we got the part. <laughs> so that's kind of how, it, was a, it was my very first audition, so it was a very big, you know, a fluke that I, that I would actually book my first audition and then work for the next 11 years. Yeah, I mean, really, who does that, you know? I mean, that's just amazing. And, well, you know, you began the show at 10 years old, and was acting something that you were starting to at such a young age, or did that just kind of happen? I mean, obviously the role was the role of a lifetime. I mean, little did you know when you joined the Waltons what an iconic television show it would end up being. But, but I mean, was that something you were kind of working towards? No, I never wanted to. I never really <laughs> thought about the acting part I was a dancer so I did a lot of ballet and tap and so the acting part of it was completely new to me and I wanted to be on commercials but I wanted to be doing cartwheels you know and things like that (laughs) so I, I never I had to learn the acting part of it so that's part of my lesson too is you know being thrown into this world that I had no idea what I was doing or what I was supposed to do or what was expected of me and you know those became a lot of my ups and downs and my tough lessons in in life but um, certainly i no never planned on it <laughs> <laughs> well you know one of the things that I, I have to ask you and i'm sure you've been asked this t- dozens of times and and that is in all the episodes that you filmed do you have one that is just kind of near and dear to your heart well, everybody does ask that, and I talk about it a lot in the book. My our, my favorite episode to film was the burnout because we got to burn the house down, and it was really fun. And I got to you know uh-huh. go over and, and live with John Ritter for a while, so that was really fun. <laughs> and um, but I think near and dear to my heart is the first casualty where G. W. Haynes, my boyfriend, was killed in a, a training maneuver, getting ready to go to war. That uh-huh. one. Um, one that stands out a lot is the grandma comes home when Ellen came back after a stroke, and then the saying goodbye to grandpa on the mountain was a was a um, was a, a tough one, but a very poignant one for me. You know, every episode of The Waltons just moved people, and even to this day, I mean, I watch it faithfully still, and it, it still just brings me to tears, you know, because it's still so true to life. And, um, and you know, now I have to say one of my all-time favorite episodes is the pilot, the homecoming. Um, and, you know, in the, for many, many years at Christmas time, it, it was like one of the highlights of the kickoff to the season because the local network channels would always, you know, play the movie. And, and it was just like, and then it kind of just faded away. And I was like, no! <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's not Christmas. It's not the holiday season without the ex- iconic homecoming episode, you know. Um, but there were just so many. Um, Christmas begins. <laughs> and exactly. It was like a perfect way, because there was so much meaning. I mean, the thing that Earl Hamner did that was just so beautifully done was that he really wrote from the heart and and I think one of the reasons why so many people love the Waltz was because 
the Wallens was this kind of family. You know, there was nothing sugar coated. There were highs, lows in between. It was a. It seemed like a real family, and it was the kind of family I think we all had a piece of in our own lives, or at least wanted to. And uh, and why do you think that even today, as it still continues to be broadcast, why do you think people still, you know, love the Waltons the way they do? I think you're right. It's the writing. It, Earl and all of the writers and, and producers who also wrote for the show just wrote these incredible stories that hold up in this time. And I think part of the, you know, the love of the family and the sense of community, and it has endeared itself to people over the years. I think also that it was a period piece, sort of set it into a place where it could go on forever. But mm-hmm. the lessons from the show are still so poignant today because, you know, in our country right now, people are wanting to come together. They're looking for a sense of community. Families are moving under the same roof. Finances are mm-hmm. hard. Times are tough. Kids are getting out of school and not finding jobs, so they're moving back home. And so you have these mm-hmm. multi generations living under the same roof. And I think it really resonates to people because they miss those times. And I and I think it's it's you know and and having family and a sense of community and a sense of belonging. I don't think that ever goes out of style. No, and and you know it, it's really. It's, the Waltons was just so reminiscent of a simpler time where, you know, this age of social media didn't exist and people actually communicated face-to-face. And, and, and I think people miss that to a point. You know, it's so hard to get away from the here and now of what we see day in and day out and deal with. Um, but that is, is something that we all still kind of aspire to, I think. Um, and it, and yeah. it's just it's just one of those shows that's never going to go off the air. It's, it's kind of like Andy Griffith. It'll be around forever because it just has that appeal. And it, and it doesn't matter what era of time you're in, it's going to always fit the moment that we're in and be relevant to, you know, what society is going through and, and the um, the things that we're encountering day in, day out, I do believe. It's um, true. You're right. One of the one of the things I was curious about is is how challenging was it to not only grow up on television, but as part of one of the most iconic television families of our time. Oh, it's not challenging at all. It's lovely. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> I have it's it's one of the it's the it's the apex of my life, right? It's something that I'll never live out, or or and I, it's something that I don't have to live down. It's a it's a wonderful part of my life, which keeps giving me gifts as time goes on. And you know, yes, there were challenges. You know, I gave up my childhood to do it. I was back and forth at school. I had very confusing, tough times of who I was and where I fit in, and and went through difficult times, but but not really because of the show itself. You know, I would have. People always say, "Do you think you would have had all these body image issues and all of these uh, self-esteem problems if you were not on the show?" And I said, "Yes, I think the show, you know, being raised in Hollywood probably exacerbated it a bit. But I think I would have had the same issues because we're all Mm -hmm. so common. All of us are so similar, and it doesn't matter whether you're on a TV show or not. We all we all have the same kinds of feelings and thoughts and issues and emotions." That's so true. That is so true. Um, it's widely known that you and the cast, the Waltons, continue to to be close knit to this day. And and would you say that they have been kind of like your adopted second family? <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. both on on the air and off the air. Absolutely, and and they are they are just my family. I don't even think of them as adopted. I just have a, a big family, and we you know we recently lost. Joe Conley, and we all gathered mm-hmm. together this past weekend for his memorial service, and and it is family. We all are in communication, and we talk to each other. I'm I'm actually seeing John Walmsley, Jason tonight, and his wife. So. Oh wow! Oh, you have to you have to extend our hellos. I um, will have him come on the show and talk about what he's doing. Oh, that would be awesome. Now, I know you guys recently had a reunion, and, and what was that like? Because you, you do see each other all the time, but um, is that something that you guys do kind of periodically um, for the fans, or, or is there going to be one in the works for the future, or, or you know, what what goes on with that? Well, the what, the reunions that we have are really for the fans. We get together on our own, but when you get us together, we talk a lot, so we don't get a lot of work done. 
So we really, <laughs> really have to focus in on being there for other people because we yeah. just start to talk and we tell stories and we catch up and we're loud and nobody can get a word in edgewise. And <laughs> so, um, but I don't know. There is a cruise that is happening. And that is happening in October, and it's you can find it on on Facebook. It's Walton uh, Cruz, and uh, a bunch of the cast members are going. I am not, but but that is going to be a big reunion out at sea for mm-hmm. ten days. Oh and, yeah, and definitely. beyond that, I am not sure what else is happening. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm sure there are other former cast of you know of big television shows that have remain in touch through the years, but I think you guys are probably um, not only, uh, you, you've done such a good job of not only being in touch and staying close just between yourselves, but you, you've always still, you know, continued to bring the fans into your world long after the show's, you know, officially over, but, un- you know, unofficially still on the air, but you're not filming any longer. And that's so important because, you know, the fans just, I mean, I think it's one of those shows that's just, like I said, it's never going to go away. The fans love it. They love you guys. Um, we we watched you all grow up as we were growing up, you know. Um, and it, it's just really interesting how that has worked for all of you and, and for the fans, too, even. Oh, our fans are very much a part of of growing up with us. I mean, they watched us grow up. And my Facebook fan page is an amazing space. I mean, I always thank everybody for for being there, but we have discussions about the show. We there's people put up prayer requests and and people talk about the show and and it's quite it's it's amazing to me. I I always say I'm just lucky enough. I'm just the one holding the bowl. And everybody gathered in the bowl, and and who would have ever thought, you know? But it's all about the fans. It's really about the people mm-hmm. who come together because they they love the show. They love what it represents. They love what it meant to their childhoods, and now to their own children's lives, and now grandchildren. Mhm, mhm. Yes, remarkable. I know. It's it's really it's really a generational type show because you know I. I just remember introducing my own children to it, and they love it. You know, and it's, it's, it, it really does not, it is not a show that was just one that was great in the year I grew up in. You know, it, it still continues to, to resonate with so many people, no matter the age. And I think that's really neat that my kids, you know, are into it as much as I was at that age. Um, now, a couple of the things that you guys have done, you know, you've made some for TV reunion movies. And do you foresee there being another installment in the future that fans can look forward to? Not that I know of. I produced those two pieces um, with uh, INSP, and um, we that was lovely to get together and reminisce about the show and honor Will and Ellen. But um, I have pitched to networks ideas of, you know, doing a, a scripted reunion special and, you know, Earl was talking about it at one point and wanted to do it and the cast has wanted to do it, but no networks have picked up on it. Ah, uh, they've got to. I'm just <laughs> I just have to, I mean, I think the fans, if, if they even had a hint that that was even a possibility, the fans would really be bugging the networks like crazy. Don't you want to pick this up? What's wrong with you kind of thing, you know? Um, because it is, I think it would be as well received, you know, the original show is still ongoing, and I think anything new that you guys would make now would would just be as as good and as popular, especially with the original cast. I mean, I think that's what really makes the show a lot of times anyway. If if you're trying to resurrect again and bring something back or do something along the same vein, it it really is a lot more meaningful for the fans. And and if you do it, we will come. We will watch. <laughs> I can I, assure you I on say, that. <laughs> but I think those networks they just think that, you know, everybody wants to see people getting voted off the island. So they just don't well, think it's you know, true. <laughs> I guess if you if you kind of pitch this whole idea of the Waltons as themselves, you know, as Mary McDonough and you know and, and Richard Thomas, and maybe just maybe in this reality world that is so far removed from reality, uh, they might just pick it up. But we would love to have you back as the Waltons, you know, and in year 2013. Um, so we ha- we will keep our fingers crossed for you for that. Um, Thank you. We would book, love to do it. <laughs> I know. It would be a dream come true for fans everywhere, for sure. Um, in your book, 
you addressed the issues of depression and personal insecurities that were amplified from your celebrity and and you know as you know things are so different in the world today for celebrities especially child stars um you know it just you know, we just learned that, um, you know, Corey Montes died from a drug overdose, and that has become, you know, accidental overdoses are becoming more and more prevalent. And what do you think is one of the most challenging things that celebrities today have to deal with, be it child stars or adult stars, um, that you guys, per se, didn't have to deal with necessarily um, back when you were filming The Walton? I think it's the loss of privacy. Everything is so instant. You know, I could get away with, you know, having a boyfriend that nobody knew, and I never brought him out in public. And Mm -hmm. sure, you know, some of the rag mags tried to find out, and they did, and, you know, they finally followed us until they got a picture. But the the paparazzi and the loss of privacy and and how everything is is fair game now. I think there used to be a a sort of respect around it, and now people are Mm -hmm. hounded walking down the street and... I think that's a huge amount of pressure. I don't oh, think, you know, it's, I, I can't imagine. Well, and, you know, and, and I think we individually, we just all want to be accepted. We all want to be loved for who we are. And, and you know, when you're in the public eye and you're being constantly scrutinized, followed by paparazzi, and critiqued on every move you make, you know, you already have this pressure of being a celebrity, as it is, and then to have the added pressure of that element, you know, mixed in, it it really does keep it on, I would think, quite a bit. And um, uh, it is really sad how it's gotten because, you know, it it almost, I'm sure as you look back, you're probably grateful that that was not part of the picture back then, you know, as your (laughs) co-stars are. I am. I am. I got away with a lot no more. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, as a result of your own personal struggles, you know, that led you to become an advocate and activist for women's body issues, and I want to applaud you for that because I think that's awesome, you know, what you have done with that. Um, But talk a little bit about that, um, if you will, because I know, you know, I'm a woman myself. I think we all critique ourselves. We're very hard on ourselves and our body image. We're constantly comparing ourselves to other women. And, and, you know, the teenage girls, you've got that whole dynamic there as well um, that comes into play. Yeah, it's, you know, there's so much pressure now. And, you know, I mean, there is there as much pressure now. There's probably more, and and the same reason what we talked about with the social media, you've got the bullying, you've got instant photographs of somebody you know from anywhere out there, and I think I mean for me I felt pressure to look perfect and be perfect, and certainly I had, you know a lot of issues that went on. But now I think gosh it's, you know, it's almost worse in a way, don't you? Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, because he, my thing is. Society is constantly putting it out there to women and young girls alike that if you aren't a size two, then you aren't beautiful or you don't measure up, you know, and and that's such a negative message that's constantly being reiterated that's getting inside our girls' heads, you know, and you have a lot of young girls that, you know, are anorexic or they're falling in bulimia because they're, they're trying to aspire to get to that size two that society says this is the perfect body, this is the perfect look, you know, and exactly. and it's really misleading our young girls down a path it of is. complete and, and utter destruction. So much emphasis is put on beauty and, and what is ex- exterior and not on what is inside. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, when I'm, a, I'm a certified life coach, so I work with people all the time about their their lives and life balance and body image and careers and transition. And, and you know, there's so, so much is about people's self-worth. And when you, you're constantly comparing yourself against people on their Facebook pages and magazines that are completely unrealistic images and they're, you can't live up to them. When we, and as many times as we... You, you see those articles about this is what a model really looks like and this is how many pictures are airbrushed and this is how many people, you know, how many people's knees are redone and their their waists are thinned and, and you see all the Photoshop of that. That is not what those mm-hmm. people look like. But yet we as yeah. women can't check out at the market without seeing those those shapes mm-hmm. and sizes and, and thinking that that is what beauty is and that, you mm-hmm. know, 
I, I certainly felt the pressure because Aaron was the pretty one, and and I didn't know what that meant. It meant to me that she had no value because Mary uh-huh. Ellen was smart and she was a tomboy, you know, and, and Elizabeth was cute and the baby, and so pretty uh-huh. is nothing. I always yeah. wanted Aaron to be something, and now yeah. We still, you know, there's still even more of that about, you know, what what everybody looks like, and and if we don't like you, we're gonna, you know, we're gonna vote against you, and then we're gonna, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> slam you on on a, in a public setting. So mm-hmm. I, I think there's an incredible amount of pressure, uh, and my what I work with people on is like returning to yourself. What is your value? Because it was what I had to learn for myself. What I wasn't Aaron, mm-hmm. and I was Mary, but who was that? And what was my value as a person? Is my only value the fact that I was on this show? Or is, mm-hmm. do I have other things to offer the world? Uh, that is so wonderfully said. Uh, because that's so true. And, and I really think that one of the most detrimental things that has come into play is reality television. Because there is so much negativity in that medium and you know you've got that facet out here being promoted and then you've got you know the body image um the outer image being promoted for not just girls but guys alike and it really does tear down your self-esteem your self-confidence and when you're in the checkout line at the supermarket and you see the tabloid magazines you see you know the magazines in general and you see these people on the cover you don't you're not standing there thinking about well golly I wonder if her arm, how bad it had to be airbrushed. I mean, you're not seeing that, and you're not thinking about no, that. No, you don't think about how much say, wow, editing so that. <laughs> exactly, you're not you're not thinking about how much editing that photo had to go through so that it could be the perfect look on a cover. Um, you're thinking about, wow, you know, she made a magazine cover because she's that skinny. I need to be that skinny. Maybe I'll make a magazine cover. And it's it's gotten, you know, reality TV has taken people that were not celebrities until they became reality stars. And I think it's right. ingrained in a lot of people's minds that, you know, I just can go out here and I can do something sensational and they'll put me on television. But before I can get there, I've got to have the perfect teeth. I've got to have the perfect look. And so people are they are putting so much pressure on themselves to aspire to this level of expectation that, none of us could ever possibly match, you know, match up to or, or achieve because the bar is always constantly being raised. You know, just when you think you've got it, there's something else out there that society is driving down our throats saying this is what you've got to do, you know. And it, it's, it's appalling. It really is. Um, it is. Especially the Don't message it's me sending to our kids. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, and also, you know, <laughs> what, what is the value of those? These people are celebrities now, but what have they done? You know, yeah. they're they're mm-hmm. having children out of you know, not that I'm voting on it at all, but I mean it's like, what did they do to become that celebrity? Exactly. Oh, mm-hmm. They you know they're a teen and they're uh, have, trying to find their baby daddy, or you know, yeah. or they're on an island, lying, stabbing people in the back, and cheating, and making all these alliances, and you know, voting people off, and or they're competing in a way. You know, or they're drinking, or they're—I mean—all of these things are so glorified, and suddenly mm-hmm. those people are are the people. And and it, I don't know—is it talent? I don't know. <laughs> I don't think it's talent. I, I'll just say it so you don't have to. I don't think it has a thing to do with talent. I think it's the it's the way of our society now, and I think that that's what's kind of has taken precedence. And and uh, you know, there's. And it's not just the body image messages that are being put out there. It's messages of all kinds, you know, everything you just said that people are constantly seeing and people get sucked into these shows. And that's why I thank God that the Waltons are still on television because at the end of the day, you can still pull up your TiVo. You can go to your favorite channel that it's on, which is a wholesome quality programming channel, I might add, especially in my area at least. And it's just, Great to see great television programming, you know, that has morals and values and good qualities that really, you know, teaches us something, not takes stuff away from who we are. It teaches us how to be better people, and it teaches us how to work through life crises. And, you know, whereas nowadays there's a simple fix for everything. But The Waltons really was a show, I think, that just – 
help people to understand that sometimes life gets hard and you don't run from it, you deal with it. And and the whole family aspect was, as a family, the Waltons always work through whatever problem may arise. And that was what, you know, kept them together, the glue. Um, and, and I think that's why people today, they, there's such a missing element of that, that, you know, people love it. So, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm glad that the show is still on because it, we need something on television to offset all of the horrible programming that exists. You know, so it, <laughs> well, that's my opinion. <laughs> and I'm not no, saying I mean, that because I'm talking true. to you. I mean, Everybody, but if people didn't watch it, it wouldn't be on because they make the things, they make shows based on the ratings and what people watch. Mm-hmm. So, that's you know, so true. There are people who are watching it. It's just like, you know, people talk about those rag magazines. If nobody bought them, then they would go out of business. Exactly. So we're very, so true. We very much like, you know, there's a part of us, and that's something that, you know, we have to deal with, is that we like, you know, like former child performers. We like to see them fail. Somehow we like to see mm-hmm. them knock down a run. And now with yeah. reality programming, we like to have the power over saying, oh, that dress is horrible, oh, she looks terrible, or that was terrible, they should go, get them off, get them off. Yeah. There's some power right. or some joy that we have in other people's failures. And I think that it's gone into mainstream programming now. So, <laughs> well, you know. I don't I don't try to watch any of it just because I say this is so far removed from reality. I really just don't want to watch it, and I don't get into it. So I, I stay away from it. But, of course, you know, when you're on social media, you see a lot of it in timelines and, and feeds and things. So it, you, you kind of get a good grasp of it without having to watch it. But <laughs> but one of the other things I wanted to ask you about is, is – um, your Acting for Life program. Talk a little bit about what that is. Well, I've, been, I've taught acting for years, and and then I've also been a filmmaker, so I've sort of put all of my all of my careers together. I have what I call this mosaic of my life, and as as teacher, as coach, as actor, as filmmaker, as writer, and and when I got engaged, I moved um, to Southern California. And people kind of heard that I used to teach, and I said, no, I don't really teach anymore. I'm really concentrating on life coaching. And then someone said, oh, but could you just help my daughter? She's auditioning for this, you know, get it to get into college. So I started, I started coaching people, and what I did was I incorporated my life coaching elements into with acting exercises, and I started to teach kids self-esteem through acting exercises and through coaching, you know, exercises as well. And so it's sort of we all have to act in our life and we'll have to audition for many, many jobs. Long gone is the day where you are you are thirty years at one job. We are constantly reinventing ourselves. And that's what I work I work with kids with that, but I also work with adults with it as well. And so I started teaching the acting for life because of teaching people how to do book reports or a power presentation or public speaking. Or now, with there's so much texting and so much social media that we have lost the art of looking someone in the eye and even being able to say our name. Mm-hmm. And so I sort of use those skills to have people feel confident in being themselves and bringing themselves forward in their life and for work or for school or whatever it might be. And that, those are great skills that can be utilized in any setting, you know, just like you said. I mean, no matter where we are, I mean, these are everyday practical things that are great takeaways for someone to use. And because at some point, something, some scenario is going to evolve that they will be able to apply what they've learned from you, you know, in that. And um, and that's so. that's amazing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that, I, well, why you know, I do it is because I never, nobody ever taught me, and mm-hmm. I had a my great one of my greatest compliments in it was a parent who said to me, he said, "Oh, gosh, you're, you're you know you're working with my youngest child. I wish I wish that she, my older daughter had had you." And I said, "I wish I had me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I wish I had someone to guide me, teach me how to communicate with my parents, learn how to." say what I felt and what mattered to me and to and to have the the support to go for what I really wanted in my dreams instead of being very, very frightened, which is what I was most of the time. 
So I know I, so I do everything in my life now because I just don't want anybody to 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 feel lost like that, like I did. So. Well, the you of my are is dedicated to for anyone who ever felt they weren't enough, and that Aww. is sort of my purpose, my reasoning for doing all the the coaching and the workshops and the public speaking and the writing that I do. Well, I I have no doubt that you've helped a ton of people along the way, um, just from what you've learned. And, and I, I'm a firm believer that that's what we're put here for, is to take what we learn about ourselves um, and, and, you know, pay it forward um, to help others. And, and you I have agree. certainly done that in your career. So um, congratulations to all your success and everything that you've done. And, and Mary, we just want to thank you so much for being with us this evening. It's been a pleasure. Oh, thank you so much for having me. And yes, we all can pay it forward. It is, you know, take those lessons and and teach them. You know, share share with people. It is there are everything happens for a reason. And I, my dad always said, make good lemonade. So I try mm-hmm. and take take it all and uh, and pour that lemonade out all over the place. <laughs> Sometimes that's just what we have to do, you know. It, it makes it makes it for everybody that way. So, uh, well, again, thank you so very much for being our special guest. It, it has been an honor and a pleasure to have you with us. Love to have you back anytime, and uh, and thank you for all that you're doing to help others. Oh, thank you. Well, take care, and uh, I'm sure we'll be in touch and uh, give our best to uh, the. Plan of the Walton, and uh, maybe <laughs> who knows? You said hello. <laughs> yes, tell the family hello, and, and who knows? I maybe will. we'll have you all on one of these days. That would be awesome. So, if and well, I'll put it this way: if they want, if the networks won't pick up something, you know, just let me know. We'll just do it right here on our show. So, <laughs> there we go. Perfect. <laughs> we'll just bring it right all here. All right. <laughs> well, thank all you, right. Mary, thank and you take so much. care. Good we'll night. See you. Good night. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> oh, what a pleasure speaking with Mary McDonough. Oh, she is a delight, and I hope that you enjoyed that as much as I did. What a great walk down memory lane, talking about the Waltons. You know, as, as she was talking about the show, um, you, so many different episodes that I've seen. I think I've seen every one about 40 times. Um, and, you know, just so many things were running through my mind about scenes and and characters and and things that had cropped up and it was just it was just really um a great treat to have her on our show and then you know on the other side of it everything that she's done since the Waltons and uh, she just continues to do things to help others and to help others be the best that they can be and and that is really what it's all about so uh we wish her nothing but the best of much continued success as she continues forward and uh and yeah who knows we might try to get the whole Walton family on one of these days that would be incredible um so Stay tuned for that, folks. <laughs> well, I want to thank everyone for joining us this evening. Again, a huge thank you to Mary McDonough for being our special guest. And if you're brand new to our program, I hope you enjoyed uh, joining us tonight. And I hope that um, you won't be a stranger, that you will be back again uh, to visit with us. We would love to have you anytime. And uh, so our show, again, is Behind the Mic Radio, and I'm your host, Dawn Mack. And just to give you a quick rundown, we're going to be off the next few nights, but we'll be back here next Thursday night at 7 p.m. Eastern. So we hope that you'll make plans to join us at that time. And uh, so with that, I will say have a great Friday, everyone, a great weekend, and we'll see you back here again real soon. Take care, all. Good night. Thanks for listening to tonight's show. You can connect to Behind the Mic Radio on Twitter at BT Mike Radio and on Facebook at Behind the Mic Radio. Check out our website at BehindTheMicRadio.com. Also, follow us right here on Blog Talk Radio where you can stay up to date on all upcoming shows. Every episode is available for immediate download upon the conclusion of each broadcast and as always on iTunes. Thank you for joining us.